Hey everyone, this is Mary Beth McAndrews from Dread Central, and I'm here with Jane Schoenbrunn, the director of We Are All Going to the World's Fair, an incredible film that is out now. Hello, Jane. I'm so excited to chat with you. It's nice to meet you. It's lovely to meet you. So um, I read your director statement for this movie, and it is an incredible director statement, and is like it lays out like why you made this movie, and I'm just you know love the movie and how it depicts being online and I would first question I want to ask you is when you were like online writing this fan fiction as a teen did you ever like make another personality for yourself or were you kind of more who you are like did you or were you kind of more like true to who you were at that age I think I was always nervous about age right yeah I, I think when you're I think it can be really hard to be creative and obsessed with creative ambition when you're a kid because you're like I want to write a movie I want to write a movie like I, I I should be writing for the X-Files I should be writing for Buffy I should be writing like the new Nightmare on Elm Street movie but you also kind of know that um you're not going to get hired as a 13 or 14 year old and also like you probably shouldn't be in retrospect <laughs> <laughs> decision that that's like a, a a good limitation um but I, I, so I think I always try to sort of like be under the radar about and not give away how young I was in those places, right? Like I, I would sort of like, and I think my writing was pretty good, but not, not good, but pretty good for that age. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so that was the main thing. But I mean, other than that, I sort of think I was showing a truer face through those spaces than I was showing in my real life, you know, like, uh, yeah, you go to those spaces and you express yourself because there's something that's like maybe difficult to express in, in real life. And, uh, and that's why I was there, you know, that's, that's yeah. what it was. That's what it gave me like this outlet. And like, I did the same thing as a teenager, like watching, I actually, when rewatching this movie, the first time I watched it, I was just, I didn't, have these realizations about why I used to write fan fiction on Neopets message boards as a teenager. <laughs> so like, it's just so interesting, especially how you talk about um, queerness and gender dysphoria and how you want to depict it as not just like in characters, but as this feeling, as this kind of tactile experience, which is a way I've never heard it described before. And it like made all of my brain lights go off in a way that I've never done before. And like, that was kind of mind blowing to hear kind of my experience depicted that way. And I wanted to hear more about kind of your thoughts about queer cinema and having it be like that vibe and that experience rather than just a gay person on screen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like important to talk about how much this movie not only like mirrored my own sort of um, unpacking and dealing with the fact that like I'm a queer and trans person uh, and and my transformation, but um, beyond that, like how it helped me figure it out. Like I didn't set yeah. out being like, I'm going to make a trans film. Like I didn't know I was making a trans film for a minute because um, I didn't know I was trans. and. Mm -hmm. I think I was just obsessed with these ideas and and these feelings that 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 sort of um I felt that I needed to explore in film because I didn't have language to describe why I was obsessed with the idea of like the internet or the screen as this space of um disassociation but also like a place where I had felt more myself than I had in other places um yeah. And I think the process of like unpacking that and unpacking like my own relationship to being an artist um, in the same way that I think Casey is like someone who is trying to figure out how to express herself as a person. I was trying to figure that out and dealing with, I think a lot of the same mix of like anger and shame and vulnerability that she is in the film. That's all trans stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and, and eventually I, called it that eventually like my egg cracked and I figured out what was what the words some of the words that had thus far been invented for these feelings were and that helped me contextualize the work further and and, and make the work with a little bit of intentionality but always just always like avoided intellectualizing it you yeah. know thinking about the impact that I wanted it to have it was more just like here's some weird shit from when I was a teenager that I'm still dealing with. Uh, let me try to make it honest. Uh, and 
that's, you know, the film is a queer film and the film is a trans film ultimately because I am those things. And, yeah. you know, I am proud of, it was certainly really scary to, to not intellectualize it or not to like sort of sugarcoat it or make it legible for cis audiences or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, but I think the film is better for it. And I think like what you're describing, the experience of sort of seeing experience that you related to made made visible that had previously been invisible um, or not invisible, but not something that you were able to like put your thumb on or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to do too. And like, it's just like, that's what art can do when it's good or cool or made honestly, right? It's like, we're all trying to find language for things that, that uh, you know, like heteronormative American society doesn't give us words for. Yeah, exactly. Ugh. Speaking to my heart. Um, but I'm curious, I feel like this movie has spoken to a lot of people that not just in how you represent queerness and transness, but also just that isolation of being a kid who grew up on the internet and like found community online. And I'm curious, have you gotten a lot of personal stories from people who have seen it about like you finally depicted what it was like for me as a kid, not I get, like from gender to how they existed on the internet? Yeah, I think that like one compliment that I've gotten a few times that I, I, I like take as a really nice compliment is that um, it feels like a film or maybe even like one of the few films made by someone who actually like understands the internet. Um, and if that's true, it's because I like have spent a lot of fucking time on the internet. <laughs> and I, I think because I like focus as much on the things that draw someone to the internet as I focus on the things that are maybe more of like, at least in contemporary American society, like our classical like warning dangers of the internet, right? It's not a screed about stranger danger or about the way in which you can get brainwashed into being something you're not on the internet. Not that those aren't real things that happen on the internet and on our contemporary internet. But I think that like what's often left out of, um, films about the internet and especially horror films about the internet with a couple wonderful exceptions um, is that um, they overlook like why the internet exists and the internet exists because there's like a desire for something that that we invented this thing to try to fulfill and that's like there's a lot of longing and a lot of loneliness and a lot of like looking for yourself or others or some combination of those two things in this space um, like we invented it. The internet isn't separate from us. It's, it's a human thing. Um, yeah. and, and it was a human thing that like has changed my life probably more than with maybe like one or two exceptions, more than any individual person did. Like yeah. the internet has made me, um, like literally, uh, and that's crazy. And, um, that's, the work is trying to like unpack those things for real, not just like sort of be like, what if there was a ghost in the computer? Well, and, like you give JLB a little bit more complexity than like a creepy predator. You know what? And like, I think people miss that in horror that like there's some, it's a little bit more complex. Well, not always, obviously there are, are people who are horrendous on the internet, but it's a little bit more complicated than just bad guys versus the good I, guys online. I, I fell down some like deep internet rabbit holes in the sort of like prep for this like finding just the people on youtube who are all right i'll tell you like uh there were like a lot of drafts of this script in a lot of different forms and and the character that eventually became jlb was uh was initially inspired by this one horrific man that i found online um the character i, I had named the character cum face uh, <laughs> and the uh the character was supposed to be this guy who always wore a mask and, and his explanation for why he wore a mask is because his face was covered in cum. Um, and uh, obviously very different character than what it eventually grew into. But like, trust me when I say that I've seen like the worst that humanity has to offer in the depths of YouTube, but it's so clear what's behind that worst that the depths of humanity have to offer. And it's like mental illness a lot of cases you're like, oh, you're dealing with some gender shit that society has not allowed you to unpack properly. Yes. Um, and that's just, that's so much more interesting than being like, remember pedophiles? Here's a <laughs> scary one. Exactly. Oh my God. It's 
Well, because like, I mean, you mentioned a director statement, like you met someone going through some stuff online and like, I have met guys like that online. And it's so weird how you get wrapped up with these people, like almost by act, you don't realize, at least for me, I didn't, you don't realize how deep you are into it until something happens. And you're like, oh no, like I need to back away from this. Like, this is not, this is very strange. It's it's weird, right? Like, right. Like this guy who started commenting on my stories when I was like 13 years old and then started IMing me and was like, didn't feel aggressive, or I guess it felt like a little aggressive, but he was just like sort of trying to build a relationship with me through I am that wasn't explicitly sexual. I mean, there was definitely a power dynamic there. Um, He was gay and there was like, I was this young kid and like, sorry, how can that not be a weird dynamic? I was certainly aware of it, but um, he, uh, he just seemed lonely and he just seemed like he needed and wanted someone to talk to. And, and I didn't really want to be talking to him, but the reasons why I did was because I could tell that he was maybe like in a worse place than I was or something, even though I was 13 and he was 35. Like, and you're like, like, this is weird that I'm responsible for this man's emotional well being. Yeah, I was like his therapist and his like confidant. Uh, and that felt really fucking weird to me and uncomfortable, but it also felt like the decent thing to do to not like yeah. abandon this person in need, which looking back on it, I would maybe tell myself that that wasn't my job. Um, but, but you're 13 on the internet. You don't know, you're like, this, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But there was like, I, I think the reason why like painting this as like the sort of stereotypical like stranger danger online experience felt why that felt like wrong or not creatively stimulating to me is because of like how much of that experience seems to be about like care when I look back on it and like deeply imperfect care and maybe care that I was misinterpreting but like certainly for me I didn't want to abandon this person who felt like they needed some care um yeah and that's weird. Uh. <laughs> so weird. Um, so this is kind of shifting topics, but um, Casey, played by the incredible Anna Cobb, how did you find her? Because she's she's impre- she's perfect. So how did you find Anna? I looked really hard. <laughs> I, I'm a big believer. Like whenever I need, whenever there's something like that that needs to happen, like whenever there's like a world and you need to find the thing that you think exists in the world, or in this case, the person who you think exists in the world, who you have no idea how to find. I say like antennas up. That's my, that's my motto when that time comes is like, I need to be listening and I need to be taking time and space to let that person to, to like act with intentionality and give myself the time to find the person. Um, And in this case, it was literally like three months of full-time work. Like I, said like we're not making this movie until I find a person worthy of the movie and we got like somewhat down the road with some people who are really interesting but who ultimately like in most cases were like fascinating humans but then when you like sit them down and have them read like a hyper dramatic scene they kind of like can't go to those places in terms of craft and you know like and and, yeah and so it became clear that what I was looking for was like this true diamond in the rough of somebody who was like not overly trained, like somebody who hadn't gone to acting school from age four and who wasn't on some CW show, like pretending to be a teenager with angst, but who like actually could feel real and authentic and like somebody who would stumble across on YouTube at at 3 a.m. and be like, who the fuck is this and what are they dealing with? Um, And you can't stop watching their videos even though it's weird. (laughs) Yeah, even though you're like, this is uncomfortable, but whoa. Uh, But then you also needed someone who was like, phenomenally talented and Anna was that person and you know like it was after two months of or three months of looking and looking in lots of weird places like I had just bought our casting director a plane ticket to New York to do some like street scouting and I had read through every entry on this like wiki about YouTubers like it had just an entry about every YouTuber with any kind of audience whatsoever and it was like the bleakest talk about dark corners of the internet like it became very clear that I wasn't going to find Casey in that actual space. Um, And then I saw Anna's picture and she kind of reminded me of Billie Eilish. And it was like a weird selfie, like the kind of selfie that Casey would have taken like in the bathroom mirror with like the lighting all wrong and these big eyes. And we got a tape from her and she was such a strong personality but also like so brilliant 
an actor that it was like, oh my God, this is that, this is the find. This is like antennas up. I finally picked up a signal that was good enough. And she like, cause she, she, I mean, she's most of the movie and I mean, it shifts a little bit, but she is most of the movie. And so how did she kind of handle having like that on her shoulders or did she just like not bat an eye at it? I mean, we worked a ton and, and I will like forever be thankful to this person for at age 17, like giving so much of herself. Her work ethic is insane. Like we were, we were rehearsing once a week for months in the lead up. She was making like fake YouTube videos in character. We were having these like long conversations about like who this person was, what this world was, like why. I think that was the key thing for her is like, why is this person looking for herself in this environment? Because Anna doesn't like horror movies and Anna doesn't really use the internet. Um, Wait, really? That's <laughs> a uh, 17 year old and nowadays that's wild to hear. Anna's fully herself, you know, like Incredible. Anna is wise beyond her years in so many ways and so perceptive and so smart. Um, and you can see that that's in the performance. Um, but uh, but I still have this like enormous gratitude. Like I talked to her a lot about um like, 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 um, Vagabond with, um, oh my God, what's that actress's name? Um, everyone's going to know that I'm not the French cinephile that I should be when they watch this. Um, it's Agnes Varda directing, um, this, uh, this, this famous French actress when she was 17. And I read this interview with Agnes Varda about like how thankful she was of like what that person gave of herself to the role at age 17. Um, and that's how I felt about Anna. I was just like, I can't believe that I found somebody brilliant enough and courageous enough. And with like as much excitement about it as me, like we both really wanted to explore what we were exploring there. Yes, thank you. You just um, saved my life, Sandrine Bonaire. I appreciate you uh, chatting it to me. So it looks like I, uh, I, I conjured it from memory when in fact, you're just giving me a lovely assist. Uh, Sandrine, of course, of course. And she's, she's, you know, she was young then, but she's been in so many great films, uh, but, um, yeah, Anna, Anna just like wanted to go there and, but to go there required giving so much of herself and, um, and she did. And that's why it, it works is she, she was able to, 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 to bring herself to those spaces. That's incredible. And I, I only have time for one more question, but if you had to program your perfect double feature with we're all going to the World's Fair, what would you pair with it? Um, I would probably depend on the day of the week. Uh, I think the film that feels closest spiritually to me is um, Taste of Cherry by Abbas Kiarostami, which is an Iranian film. Um, oh, he's incredible. Oh my God, an incredible filmmaker. He's kind of my favorite. Like him and him and David Lynch are my, are my guys uh, and Cronenberg can be in there too. I've got three dads. Uh, those are my three dads. Um, <laughs> And uh, I love the range. You have a really great range of parenting from your three dads. <laughs> yeah, they all bring something different. My dad's brings, and then I've got some moms. We could talk about them next time. But uh, <laughs> but Kiristami's work, I think, is a lot about um, it's like self-reflective and it's like reflecting on the medium that it's 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 making work within. And it's both trying, it's it's like talking about like what is realism in a medium that's like by in essence a reflection or a dream um and this idea of like the limits of what we can know about a person as another person um which is i think the center of taste of cherry it's about this man who's um suicidal and is intending to to commit suicide and um is looking for somebody willing to bury him uh, once in this grave that he's dug for himself. Um, and so it's it's him almost like cruising. He's cruising around um, this the city that he's in, and he's picking various like people up off the street and 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 offering to pay them to do this job. And um, and all of them want to know the same thing. They all want to know like why he's doing this, and they all want to talk him out of it, and they all want to sort of understand what sadness could be in there so deeply that like they that 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 he would ask such a thing, thing of them um which is obviously the impulse the correct you know that that is the impulse and but ultimately what i think the film comes to, comes to be about and i had seen it many times but i watched it like while i was working on world's fair not even as inspiration but it just hit me so hard that like what this film was about is that like all of those people in that car, which for Kiristami, I think I always say that like screens for me, I want to feel like cars feel for Kiristami. 
this oh, beautiful yeah. metaphor for um for film um it's just like a space this liminal space um what that film ends up being about is that all of these people sitting in the passenger seat while this man is sitting in the driver's seat wanting to understand they'll never be able to they'll never be able to like fully get inside this person's body and brain and, and really understand they can understand context they can have him try to verbalize it in language but they can never really understand or feel um and in the same way film is an inherently limited medium right like we can watch a film but not and think we understand think we understand casey because we understand her flickers of her home life or, you know, like what her, what her environment is like or what the things she says to us about who she is mean. But we can't ever get, we can't ever like become that person and understand yeah. that person fully. And, and, and so like in the same way that like this relationship between JLB and Casey is mediated by the limits of like physical space and the screen, our relationship to the art we consume, your relationship to me, it's all, you know, it's all mediated by the same force and and that idea that I saw in Taste of Cherry like broke it open for me emotionally in a really in a way that was like exactly what I needed at that point. Okay, I need to watch that movie immediately. I'm very to check it out. <laughs> Otherwise, um, completely different than my film. You know, it's like we oh, don't yeah. have, films don't have much in common except for that sort of spiritual uh, connection. So I I can't wait to watch it. Well, Jane, thank you so much for joining me today to chat about your film. It's and... such a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mary Beth.